All right, good morning. We are ready for Genesis part three, lesson three. We have moved quite quickly, if you consider where we started, we are already in Genesis 16, 17, and 18. And again, this week we had three chapters to cover. And that was a whole lot of information, um, especially if you consider how much we love to dive into the what ifs and what does this mean and what do you think was going on there. And, you know, we have all these, uh, you know, kind of additional questions that are kind of beneath the surface of, the, of what the story is. Um, we were talking about, you know, why is it that it seems like the curriculum is been, has been written in a way that we, we fly over so quickly some of these stories that are so, tr I think they're just so precious. But if you stop to think about it, what are we at, 49 or 50 or something like that chapters? Can you imagine how many weeks it would take us to get through a book like Genesis if we slowed down too much? And already at this point, people, we're in part three of this study, and so we've been qu uh, several months now already just in the book of Genesis. If you slow down too much, you also lose people. So I do think you, you kind of have to take it from that perspective. That's number one. But the other thing is this. I was, I was talking with um, a friend uh, in Sunday school class yesterday who was talking about that she's about to start the book of Matthew. And of course, right away, my mind starts jumping back into Matthew. And I'm thinking, yeah, I said, now the good thing about Matthew is once you figure out the segment divisions and how it's flowing in the in the author's perp, you know, to, to accomplish the author's purpose, there's a, a, a segment of narratives. They all fall together in twos or three chapters usually of the book of Matthew, and it's narrative, 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 right? But when you pull back and look at it, you go, oh, but what this is doing is accomplishing telling you this about your author's purpose, okay? I think that's what's going on in Genesis as well. What we are seeing is through, through a, but the author's purpose is slightly different. Now, we know the major purpose is what for the book of Genesis on the whole? What is the author's purpose in this writing? Okay. Very good. Who is God and who is man and who is man in relationship to God? But I also think there might be a secondary thing that we could be looking at. You know how you have segment divisions, right? Like in Revelation, we had in the spirit, right? Or we had the breakdown uh, through the different worships. That was a really interesting one. Uh, well, in this one, I think that possibly we definitely see these narratives about characters. That one's obvious, right? We're, we're now in who? Abraham, and then we're going to get to Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Joseph, right? And so we're going to see the progression of the patriarchal unfolding of this message, right? But are there any other subjects that you see kind of going in here that God is trying to reveal to us? Where did we start in Genesis, and what is it that God has been kind of pulling us along to see, or what has he been revealing? Redemption. That's right, the redemption story. So if you think of it from that perspective, then there's another way to view what you're looking at so that you don't get uh, bogged down in narrative, 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 but rather you look at the narrative from the perspective, what is God showing me about salvation, about his redemptive plan? Because by the way, in PS, all the way back in Genesis 3, from the moment man committed their act of sin by violating God's law, God said immediately to Eve, what did he promise her? A seed who would crush the head of Satan who had tempted them and they had gone into uh, the, a commission of, a, of an act of sin. Okay, so if we look at it from that perspective then, and I'm hoping this is going to help us a little bit, just to view what we're looking at so we don't get so deep in the weeds, which is fun in the moment, but you have to kind of come back up again at, to a higher level and view it down from a perspective of where are we in the narrative now. I have not taken the time yet to try to see w what is the progression of this salvation message. Have you ever done the book of Romans? Have you seen how Romans does that? All, all men are sinners, that, you know, um, 
what is it that it's Jew and Gentile, it's a com conflict between those two kinds of perspectives, and so he jumps back and forth. But in that unfolding message, he does the same thing concerning the subject of salvation. Uh, there's a progressive order of subject matters of concerning your salvation and the, the doctrinal issues about uh, salvation, justification, sanctification, even the sovereignty of God, which, by the way, this week I went and dove into because it fit with some of the things we're looking at here. But in um, Romans 9, 10, and 11, the whole, that segment division in Romans is all about the sovereignty of God and salvation, how he has that power and that right, that authority. And who are you, all man, to argue with God? He, he's not saying, well, therefore God's unfair or God's unjust, and he can be unjust and unfair if he wants to. He is never unfair, and he is never unjust. But, but what he is saying in there, he's trying to press on you in that particular segment that God is the sovereign over it. And so because you know who your God is, you can trust him. He is going to do and accomplish everything he has promised for you, even in your, your shortcomings and your failures in it. You can count on God because he's sovereign to do exactly what he has promised to you. If you believe him by faith, it is a done deal. You don't have to. You don't have to live up to any expectation or any standard in order to enter into that relationship with God. Once you enter into it, what you do, as we were talking about even a little bit earlier, Kristen mentioned the idea of sanctification. That subject to sanctification, which there's a whole segment in Romans on that too. Now that you're saved, now you enter into the works, but the works are sanctification for what's already been accomplished through salvation. Salvation is first. That's by grace. That's the work of God, and all you do is believe God. Now you're in, in your salvation. Now you're going to work that out. What, that's what James teaches, right, that your, your faith should be demonstrated through your works. And if it's not, is that really even a faith that will save you? So I'm hoping that kind of an explanation to you about kind of coming up higher um, get up in the airplane and look down on the bigger picture of what's going on in the book of, of Genesis on the whole. Try not to get too bogged down in each of the storylines so that you lose the bigger message. There's a bigger picture message here of what God is trying to do in teaching us who God is and who we are. And this subject of redemption is, I think, uh, the subliminal message that's going on here as well. So I just challenge you guys to take some time and go back. If, I know it's a lot of work, but if you really want to dig into this deeply and get more out of this than just knowing the narratives, if you're wanting to really understand what is God accomplishing in this writing for me as, a, as his child, what does he want me to know about who he is and what he's doing? Why is he telling me all about Abraham, what God did with Abraham? Well, there's a redemption story in this that he wants me to see, not so much about wars between kings and kings and how Abraham rescued someone. It, it's, it's a, there's a bigger point to it. Why did he rescue? Why did God put the enemies of the Canaanite enemies into the hand of Abraham? What was his purpose? Have you considered that thought? What do you think is the reason God, in that particular narrative, why did we need to see Abraham have that kind of a victory. What was God showing Abraham? He was his shield and his protector. And, and from the narrative of redemption, I'm bringing that seed. What is he telling Abraham, whom he, whom he brought to that land to begin with? That's right. He's going to. He's going to do supernatural things to accomplish it. Right. He. Th this victory that he had with those kings uh, from Babylon that came in was a supernatural divine work of God. And when he met Melchizedek, remember, he even said, God gets the glory in this. It's, it, uh, Melchizedek said, praise be God who gave you the victory. And so what it shows is the sovereign work of God through men who love him and submit themselves to honoring God and believing God um, but God, regardless of what any man individually does, God is going to accomplish the work. He will save those who can be saved, 
who, who will be saved, right? And he's the sovereign in that redemption plan. He's the one who determines what the standard is. And he's told us what the standard is, right? What's the standard? Belief. <laughs> Believe God that he said, I'm going to send a seed. Do we know who the seed is in our current place in history? Yeah, because we've got a written record in Galatians 3 that tells us, and that seed is Christ. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I hope that explanation might help kind of release some people, because some I know, you know, they really get down in the weeds and get stuck in the narratives, and they're very interesting and cool, and we're going to dig some of those points out today, no, no doubt about that. I mean, don't worry that we, we're not going to do that. But I do think that it's important for you to, to also understand that it's not as important that you get all the details about each narrative as it is that you get the bigger message. That is, how is God, what is God doing in that narrative to show me that he's bringing about the redemption of, of man through the seed that's coming? And what is he doing miraculously in order to accomplish that? And why does he do it in the way that he does? Why does he... Why does he work through two old barren, yeah. uh, an old barren woman and an old man of, you know, uh, at the age of 100, right? So, okay. All right, now, one more thing I, I want to talk to you. This is, again, more of our 101 training that I try to do each time I teach. Um, you all are working on, I hope, <laughs> a list on what you're learning about God chapter by chapter, writing down, this is what I see about God. Now, is there a lot of repetition in your list making? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there definitely is. Okay, so I have a little trick that I d decided to uh, put in. I spent a lot of time on this. I shouldn't have, but I did because I, I thought, oh, this is a great place to start. What I did was rather than making a list of repetitive things that I'm learning about God from, from each narrative, which is a very good thing to do, and it's a very simple way of approaching it. But what I did was I went back into each chapter and found the, the, the use of which title for God. And just so I put them in blocks like this. And so they're very short, and all they are is definitions from the original language showing me which chapter uses which titles for God in them. What, so I, because I thought, you know, that might be that might be more declarative to me because the other is subjective. I'm making a subjective observation of what I think God is showing me about himself, but the use of his actual name is the most clearly defined understanding that God wants us to have about what he's doing in each of those chapters, right? So we see in Genesis 1 that he's God Elohim, right? And what is the Elohim definition? He's the God creator. And what happened in chapter 1? God created. <laughs> okay, in Genesis 2, we see he's called Lord God. Now we have the introduction of Jehovah, right? And what is Jehovah? What is that definition of God? Does anybody remember? There you go. It's, it's his relationship name. It's his most personal, intimate name. It's, the, it's, the, it's actually the I am name that he said to Moses, go and tell them I am sent you, right? How, how will they know who has sent me, Lord? Tell them I am. And so Jehovah, it, in chapter 2 then, because it's his personal name, what do we see the narrative of chapter 2 about? God's creating man, the intimacy of that creation being distinct and unique from everything else that God created. And therefore, he entered the first use of the word. He introduces the intimacy of relationship between God and man, whom he created. The, the crowning creation of the creation, first he formed, then he filled, right? And the very last thing he put into that creation was us because he prepared everything for us first. That's an amazing thing. Okay, so that gives you an idea of what I did. I just kind of went through and went, okay, in Genesis 1, it's Elohim. In Genesis 2, it's Jehovah. Okay, and so then progressively go through each of the chapters if you want to and look to see 
And what you end up doing is being able to copy and paste a lot of them because you're repeating a lot of, a lot of times it's Jehovah, 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 Jehovah. And if that's true, then what is it that you know about each of those chapters? He wants you to know what? His, he's your personal relational God. He's a God of intimacy with you. So uh, that's really cool. And now this week we've had some new ones. We're, we're now seeing a couple of new things, and we're also seeing um, a new presentation of God. We had God appear in G Genesis 15 when he kept covenant with Abraham. How did God physically appear to Abraham in that account? <coughs> That's right, a flame of fire, a torch, and a, a smoking pot, right? And what we talked about was how those are also depicted in other places in Scripture where when he's leading Israel in the wilderness, it's by a, a fire by night and a cloud by day, same thing, right? The, the cloud and the fire. So what we see in that, that is kind of the first time we see God portrayed through an imagery form rather than the Lord coming in a vision or the Lord coming and say, speaking. Now he's physically presenting himself, but how does he present himself? Does man see God face to face? No. And so what we're beginning to see now this week is why that's the case. Why we don't get to see God face to face. Why? I mean, if you think about a person who doesn't really know much about God, they're going, but why doesn't God just show up? I cannot tell you how many times I've had that conversation with my son. Well, if God would just show up in my living room and talk to me, I'm going, oh, you would be a greasy spot on the carpet, hon. You know, <laughs> because you cannot see God face to face and live. So, all right. So I, this is kind of what we're, we're looking at this week is just seeing this progression of what God is revealing to us about who he is. We're seeing the progression of the storyline or the narratives that show us how God is bringing about salvation. The, the what is the right word in this? Um, just the patience of God and the, the fortitude. The, the, he, he sets a plan and not, he does not deviate. And you may deviate and you may fail in your belief. You may have weaknesses in believing God in that moment on a day-to-day -day basis but but the fact that God looks at your heart and he's and he says of Abraham you are mine I have made covenant with you and therefore I'm going to work with you even in your in your frailties does that make you feel really like <sighs> relieved <laughs> to know that God will work with us even in our frailties now um, I, I can't have to caveat that by also saying yeah but that's not your goal to be a failure. Your goal is to be a success, right? However, I think what's really great is that God reveals to us that, that his expectation of us is not perfection. He, d he knows we need a savior. That's why he's doing what he's doing. But we have to also, I think, come to a place where we recognize we are weak and we're frail and we, we don't walk perfect lives before the Lord. We want to. But you should want to, let me put it that way. If you love God, you want to. But give yourself a little bit of grace in that. But then just keep going back to the Lord for that washing, you know, for the forgiveness of, of the times when you're not living up to it. And I do think that's what we see here with Abraham, right? How many times has Abraham failed? A bunch. Did you? I mean, I used to think of David as the, the big, he is a man after God's own heart, but how many things did he really fall short in? I mean, he blew it in marriage, he blew it in, uh, with the wife, he, he literally sends uh, Uriah out to die, right? And yet, he, he, God calls him a man after his own heart. Well, I, I almost feel like God could say that about Abraham. But what does he call Abraham? The friend, a friend of God, the friend of, I love that. Okay. So that's kind of the 101 backdrop I wanted to cover with you today. Now we're ready to, dry, to dive in and look at what we see here. Um, uh, you know, let me say this real quick because I know I'll forget. At a glance charts, are y'all keeping up on these? You getting your chapters filled in on your at a glance chart? Please do that for yourself because you're going to be really thankful at the end of this, if you if you have those at a glance charts, when I get finished, I will reduce the size of everything and make it tinier, 
<laughs> so that it can all fit on one page front and back probably when I'm done and I can fold that up and put that in my Bible and have it handy when I need it. It is so valuable. If you have a, a, a precept, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, let me get my throat cleared here. If you have a precept inductive Bible study Bible in the back, I think it's the back of, of each chapter, there's a chart there that you can also fill in there. I got to confess, I'm not really good at always remembering to get in there and fill that in, but the times I have, I've been so thankful when I'm sitting in church and trying to remember where are we, right? So that was your reminder about your at-a-glance charts. Keep those up to date. Okay, if you, do, if you keep them up to date as you move along, it's not a big job. But if you don't, then it is a big job. <laughs> so, all right, now, now we're ready. Let's go in. We are going to tackle chapter by chapter. That's how we're going to do this. We're going to start with 16 and just progress through. And what I want to do is, as always, outline these chapters. And then what we're going to do is, as we are outlining and, and giving our paragraph divisions, we will discuss the points that we're looking at in each of those chapters along the way. I think that way we can both get a discussion about what we looked at. Uh, we can do some word studies and uh, on the things that are significant or, or insightful to us. And also, when we're done, you will have on your observation worksheet your outline, how your paragraphs break down and what your chapter title is. Okay, so let me see if I can find my day one homework. The first thing you always do is look for your keywords. You mark all those, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got people, places, and events because we're looking at historical record. So you, those are the first three things you want to ask yourself. Who, who is this? Where are they? And what is the event that's taking place? And then any other specific keywords that have a, str a strong uh, influence on what the author is talking about in the, in the narrative, okay? So what do you see going on in chapter 16? Who are your key people and words? Okay, Sarah, Abraham, and Hagar, all right? And where, what about location, places? Canaan, Canaan is, right, yes? The, in, in the wilderness, okay. And where did she come from? From Egypt, okay. And then there's a couple of places named, the cities, Kadesh and Bered, okay, those should have been marked. And then there's a well, which is a geographical location, okay? And so you, you should have that bear, Lahai Roy, <laughs> okay? Which was really very cool when you did your word study on that. I'm hoping you did word studies, okay? All right, all right, so let's start off then going through that chapter. What do you see going on in verses one through three? In Genesis 16, 1 through 3 would be your very first paragraph. Sarah's helping God with his work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sarah's helping God out a lot, yeah. And, what, and how did she help God out? What, it, what was the conclusion? She's not for Yeah. She's just paying God. Okay. Yeah, for, chill, for the sake of cheer. So what do you have kind of going on in this part of the message then? What is real... It, in today's language, what would we call this arrangement? <laughs> oh, well, besides the polygamy, but yeah. which is a problem, right? <laughs> a swing. <laughs> okay, now, you've, now we're dating ourselves. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Thank you very much. It's surrogacy, right? So she's having, she has, by the way, did anybody do any uh, research on this idea of what was going on? With, what did you come yeah. It was accepted. It was culturally uh, the way that they handled uh, a, a barren, barren situation in a family. Now, what do we do today for women who are barren? Adoption, in vitro, or a surrogate. A same thing, right? Now, the only difference is our husbands don't have to marry the surrogate, right, and move in. But 
of course, we're talking ancient history back before they had those medical ways. So their way of having a surrogate is what they did in this story. Did you know that? Did you understand that this was a standard practice of the day and it was acceptable? Does that change your view at all on what you see Sarah doing in the story? Yeah, like, I'll no bring kidding. It here or not, and I'll be the first wife, so to speak. Right. I'll take that place. In yeah, I now have risen to to a position of honor and importance in the life in the the life of the husband. Therefore, now I am basically usurping <coughs> your position as my mistress, right? Thank you. Exactly. That's so, sh so what is culturally acceptable is not necessarily the way to solve a problem, is it? Although we have, we have a lot of that going on today where uh, people are willing to bend their, their moral uh, compass or their, the, the plumb line that God has given us in his word of what's right and what's wrong. And so in order for us to accomplish something, we, we think we want to accomplish a certain ministry or a certain mission of some kind for the glory of God. But to get there in the world that we're in today, we have to bend our values and commit some other violation. So what do you think is the problem in that then? Yeah. She's helping God out. It, first of all, she's apparently assuming that God is not doing that. What else might be the, the thing there? Do you, do you think at this point Sarah understands that she is the one who will bear the heir? She might not. She might not. Yeah, she doesn't. As a matter of fact, Abram doesn't even seem to have known that yet. If there's going to be a place in this journey where... where mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's not until chapter 17 that God actually tells verbally to Abraham, it is Sarah who will bear you the heir. And that's, at that point, what is Abraham at that point, like 99? Yeah. Yeah. That's all of that is all that is crazy. So, I, I think what's really interesting is when you start digging back into the story and putting yourself in their scenario and trying to really, in your mind, work it out. You thinking, okay, this is in their world. This is culturally acceptable. So she goes to Abram and says, "Aha! I have a scathingly brilliant idea." <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that the the Trouble with Angels that movie with Haley Mills? She was always getting in big trouble. She had scathingly brilliant ideas. Okay, I love her. <laughs> okay, <laughs> my friend Celeste has scathingly brilliant ideas, and they get us in big trouble, but they're fun. <laughs> I marked that for the end. Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Thank you. Okay. It just kind of brought me back to the tree. Yes. You know, where there's Eve, and, and Adam's like, okay, I'll do it. Like, I'll yes. just go along with you instead of going, well, I don't know about this. Like, there wasn't even a conversation where anyone was like, well, maybe we should ask God. Maybe we should wait. Like, maybe, you know. Yes. Yes. The, actually, so you actually hit on, on my secondary point. The first point is Sarah's impatience with, with waiting on God was, a, was the biggest problem. The idea of the surrogacy was really not a, the bigger problem because culturally they considered it acceptable, and apparently sh she had no idea that she shouldn't be doing that, although, although you wonder about the marriage thing, right, that they didn't understand marriage as one man, one woman. But tell me, what do we know about, on the whole, about the patriarchal system throughout all of the Old Testament? Was there a lot of polygamy going yeah. on? Yeah. There was. What about concubines? And concubines, okay, and that's a whole other storyline, like when we get into the Book of Kings and with David and Solomon. I mean, how Solomon had, what, 900 concubines or something? No, she's not a concubine because he married her. And, and, but, but culturally, did anybody research that? What has to happen for that to be permitted? He married her. Took her for wife, it says. Uh-huh. So what, what does that mean had to have happened there? 
What part did Sarah have to play in, in order for that to happen? Do you know? First of all, it was her idea. Take, take Hagar, my handmaid. Apparently, it, that was the cultural solution to this. It was the norm. It was what they were doing in that day. And, but when she presented this to her husband as an idea for s the solution to no baby yet, right, she had to be the one to okay this. She had to s say to her husband, it's okay for you to do this. Go ahead and take, because she is his first wife. So she does have uh, uh, the seniority in the relationship. Even in foreign cultures today where they have polygamy like this going on, they have the same thing. The first wife has the higher, uh, do you, how many of the oriental movies do you see where there's the, the head wife and then all the others are s subjugated under her? Uh, that is the scenario that's been presented here to us. So what we see then is Abraham listened to the wife of Sarah. Now what should Abraham have done? And listen to whose voice? God. How about the voice of God? Do you see anywhere in the storyline that Abraham went to the Lord for instruction or counsel? Nope. Okay, now let's go back to Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 and talk about what did we know is the designed role for man in the marriage relationship. Yes, he is the... He is the priest, the provider, and the protector. And as the, as the provider and, and the protector, what you see is the leadership role, that he is the one who makes. So even though Sarah made this suggestion to him, take my handmaiden and have a child with her, uh, Abram should have gone to God, number one, and secondarily, it was his decision. So when we move on in the story then, so the first part here, one through three, we see Abram marries Hagar. Now, you, there's all kinds of ways of titling that, but that's, you, and you can get real descriptive, and I had to really keep disciplining myself to narrow it down a little bit. But in that marrying of her, I'm gonna put this up here, this little tiny bit of information here, that um, this had to do with Sarah's impatience Also, her even lack of faith, maybe, that God would be doing this through her. Either she didn't know it, and I think she maybe didn't at this point. God had not specifically said it's through Sarah yet. However, her what should have her conclusion been about that, considering God's view about marriage? That it really had to be her, because God only recognizes that marriage of one man and one woman, right? And therefore, she should have assumed that it would be her. However, she apparently didn't. She was having a lack of faith. But was her lack of faith at this point reasonable to consider? She's how old? 76, 76 at least years old, right? And she hasn't yet had a child. And by this point in her life, her womb has probably dried up even if, if she had been able to have children prior. She is at a point in her, in her life now where it does, it does not seem conceivable that she could conceive, <laughs> right? And so Sarah's impatience, there's her lack of faith, there's um, even her, her desire to help God out, so to speak, in that, right? And then the second problem here is Abram, he listens to his wife. Abram listens to the voice of Sarah. What he should have done was should have called on God, should have inquired of God on this, right? And ultimately, I'm going to put this on here, Abram is the leader. His decision. Okay, so now that helps us, I think, understand a little bit better when you get to four through six, and we see what happens in the next part of the story. Sarah despises or treats Hagar harshly. 
Yeah. So, so Hagar conceives, and then they, there's a rift that develops, right? So Hagar conceives. Okay, and then she despises Sarah. Now that's an interesting word to look up. Did anybody do a word study on that word despise? Yeah, I did. I know I did. Did you? I did. Oh, you did. did. You did. Uh, oh, good. Tell me. So it's 704.3. Mm -hmm. I apparently didn't write down the Hebrew word. That's okay. It, it's, it's not super uh, important. Mm -hmm. And then it says disdain, showing little regard. Okay. Disdain, uh, showing little regard, uh, contempt, um, to bring contempt or to dishonor. Now, obviously, e even if it wasn't a, a mistress and, and, um, servant relationship, is that the way you should treat someone who you live with and whom you share life with, with disdain and with contempt and with, and how arrogant of Hagar to think that because now she's pregnant, well, good for her. Wow, she's so blessed. And she's, rather than appreciating that God has conceived in her womb, uh, instead, she turns then on her mistress and begins to treat her with disdain. It's no wonder that Hagar, that Sarah is going to do what she does next, right? What does Abram do in that scenario? So now she's beginning to treat Sarah badly, show her dis dishonor. What does Abram do concerning when, he, when Sarah comes to him and says, this is the problem? Yeah, he passes the buck again. Okay, where's that leadership again? You're the head of the house. You're the leader. You're the protector, right? Uh, and he and literally, and Sarah says to Abraham, "May the wrong done to me be upon you." Is it is it due him? Does he deserve that response? Yes, he does. Why? Why does he deserve to be the one who's blamed for the mess? It was his decision. Now, she can have a scathingly brilliant idea and take it to her husband, but what he does with that idea is his responsibility, and the buck stops at the top. And since in that marriage relationship, he's, it's kind of like in a family where the wife says, oh, I really want a new pair of shoes. The husband knows they need to pay the bills, and there's not enough money for the new shoes. But he goes ahead because he doesn't want to fight with her, and he doesn't want to deal with it. He just says, do what you want. Go ahead. Do however you want. And that's ex basically what he says to her. Treat her however it seems right to you. Now, wait a minute. Has he resolved the tension between the two women? So what is he doing when he sends his wife, his, his wife Sarah, off to handle Hagar's rudeness? Oh, yeah. He literally, he, his disregard for his responsibility to Sarah, he, and he did so. He just basically, he, he um, passed the buck to her. You deal with her. You deal with Hagar, right? And then he said, and, and he did so without first making peace between the women. And his job is to be the, the leader, the spiritual leader. So he's the priest as well. Not only the leader, he's the priest. And as priest, he's to keep harmony in that family. Now, what does this tell us then about polygamy? <laughs> bad idea. Bad idea. Yeah, bad idea. I can remember back when my daughter um, was going through her divorce early in, the, in those years, and it was really a struggle. But when she was living with us, there were times when my daughter and I would get upset with my husband and with the two of us would gang up on him. And he's like, this is like having two wives in one house. I mean, you know, <laughs> because now she's an adult and she's viewing things really more from my perspective where when she was little, she might side with her daddy just because he's daddy, right? But now she's looking at this going, no, dad, no, no, <laughs> you know? And so he felt like he had two wives. Well, that's, that's what Abram allowed to happen in his home. He allowed, he agreed with Sarah. Okay, Sarah, yes, I'll marry her. 
Yeah, great, uh, great idea. Yes. And instead of consulting God, which is his, his responsibility as priest and leader to do, he allows a secondary wife to come into the situation. Now there's turmoil in the family, and Sarah's looking at Abraham and said, what are you going to do about it? And he says, oh, you handle it. Did you happen to do did, a work study on sites? No, I did not. Okay. Okay, good. I did. Um, I found it fascinating. So it is, it means, um, it's 55869, so it's A-Y. Give me that name again, um, that number. 5869. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. State contrary to will of God. And that's the site that's in verse 6. Okay, so, and this is 16.6, um, okay. And it's the word sight. That's interesting. No, I did not do that. So let's read that again, 16.6. But Abraham said to Sarah, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. Oh, interesting. So in other words, don't do what's right according to God's standard. Don't do what is, is morally right by her. Go back and treat her however you want to in your anger, in your frustration. Yeah, and Sarah. Both of them did. Right. Well, they knew she was with child because um, that's why there was the argument. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Now you got a frail, pregnant woman, and you and there's this harassment going on. What is that old saying? Do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. And here's Sarah treating her. In, in a way that you know is not righteous and upright or good. And so I like the fact that you did the word study on that word sight. I didn't catch that one, but that makes sense, actually. So literally, Abraham is just saying, go ahead, treat her badly. Yeah, do what you want with her. Oh, interesting. And so then you've got the answer here, then, is what Abram does is um, Abram gave Sarah authority get his authority. Okay, so this is an example of what not to do, right? Uh, he delegated his responsibility to her, and he did so without first making peace between them. This is terrible leadership, right? And then what does Sarah do? Exactly what he told her to do. He treated Hagar um, harshly. Now, I did do harshly. Did anybody do that one? Okay, let's look at that one. That's in 16.6 also. Harshly is uh, number 1631. I'm going to run out of room. Uh, A-N-A-H. Not that that's super important for you to know. It means afflict, mishandle, oppress, and humiliate. Oh. Yeah, that, that's like, ow, afflict, mishandle, oppress, no wonder she ran, and humiliate. But in a way, I almost f feel like that little thought came to my mind just now, you know, what do they say about eating your own words? I mean, when she treated her mistress in this way, now she's getting back a, a taste of her own medicine, and it's not so sweet. And so is this actually a scenario that is so, so typical in everyone's life? I mean, we, we get this tit for tat going on in family dynamics. Um, we forget to go back to God and ask him, how shall we handle this? You know, if Abraham had called both of those women into the room and all of them got on their knees and bowed their, their heads before the Lord and prayed about it before they made the decision to 
have Hagar become wife, God would have made it clear to Abram. He would have come to him in a vision. We'd have had another paragraph in here. The Lord appeared to him in the night in a vision and said, no, Abram, don't do that, right? But we don't have that because instead they, they acted rashly. They did not, Abram did not fulfill his appointed role as the protector, the provider, the, the priest. Um, and so now we have this discord going on, and polygamy always ends up in discord. How many stories do we have in the, in the Bible of these, these polygamous relationships, and it always ends up with a big mess and inner fighting and um, everybody vying for the attention of the patriarch in the family and, and for the, the choicest of the land and the choicest of the inheritances, whatever. So there's always a problem in this. Okay. So now let's go. Isn't it interesting about what you just said? If you had waited, you wouldn't have had that issue at all. No. None of this. None of that. Would, we could just take it out and throw it away. The thing is God showing up and saying, okay. Okay, through Sarah your, what, is your baby going, going to come? Yeah. Okay, so now elevate yourself up in that airplane and look down and look at this bigger picture and say, so what do we see going on here? Any, any thoughts? So what... If, in fact, he had done the right thing and uh, d went to the Lord with it first and not married Hagar, mm -hmm. then the Lord would have eventually showed up anyway to say, okay, now it's time. Now, tell me this is, it, just as a side thought here. Why did God wait as long as he did to work with, to have this child be born through it? There you go. Okay, that is why. Okay, so that takes us then to the understanding of why in the next chapter we see a new title given for God in there where it's I am God Almighty, where that name comes in to play is significant because what he does is he waits until it is impossible by human standard so that it is clear that this child, and not only that, but I love the fact that he did come and show up and make an appearance at the tent of, at the Oaks of Mamre because he's making it clear that this is a significant, pivotal moment, and I am here t because it's important enough in this narrative that I'm telling my people through the written word. God knows that that's what's going on here, right? This is all going to be recorded for us to read. He's making sure that we understand that, that Sarah would be the one to have this child, not Hagar. What does that do for the issues that we got going on in the world right now between Ishmael and Isaac? Yeah. So that people know through the written word, the canonized word of God, that God is saying it is not Ishmael through which I am going to accomplish these things. He, even though he's the firstborn and in the eyes of the world, that's the way to go, but God makes it really clear in a, in a little bit that it is not through Ishmael that he's going to work. Okay, seven to nine then, let's look on that next part. What does Hagar do? She flees. And then when she flees, what does the Lord do? <laughs> the, the Lord sends her back. Yes. Isn't that... Um, an amazing thing to think that there you are, you've run. First of all, how many times in our relationships when we have, first of all, Hagar kind of started it, right? Hagar knew this. When she went into this relationship with Abram, she understood. You, you know that she knew full well the purpose of her marrying uh, Abram was to be a surrogate and to produce a child that would then be given to Sarah and it would be Sarah's child. That was the expectation. How many situations in our world today where we do surrogacy and the surrogate changes her mind and keeps the baby? How disappointed you are. This is the heart of Sarah in this. She is broken. She is disappointed. And on top of all that, Hagar begins to cause strife in the family. So then Sarah runs away as if she's been so mistreated. From her perspective, what? From Hagar's perspective, she's running why? She thinks this is unfair. She's been mistreated so badly. She should be having all this honor. She should be the exalted wife. She should, she should have been the first wife, not Sarah. 
He's the one who was able to give Abram a baby, not Sarah. Obviously, God made a mistake in giving him Sarah, right? But God's plan is something different. God's plan is to wait long enough that both Abram and Sarai are so far gone down the, the, uh, the road of aging that it is only possible for her conception by something that's miraculous and supernatural. God is going to birth a supernatural nation by a supernatural con conception in an, in an impossibility because he is God Almighty. It's like Lazarus when Christ came four Waited. days late. Yeah. Yes. Been in the tomb yes. And, and, and it was like, it's just to show who I really am. Exactly. That's a really good uh, equivalent mm -hmm. message there that God waits until it is without doubt that, that God is doing something supernatural. Yes, it, w it would. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, you do. Although, you know, I don't know how long women were still conceiving children in those days. I'm not sure. But by 90, for sure they weren't, <laughs> apparently. I mean, because that's what God did. He made sure he went long enough that it was an impossibility on human standards for a woman to conceive a child in her womb. Whether she was fertile or not, she could not conceive at 90, right? Even if at, at, in her younger years she had 15 kids, at 90 she's not having a baby, right? And that's what God was waiting on. He was waiting to make sure that on a human level, everyone, it was obvious, this woman could not conceive, and then she does. And she conceives and gives birth to a healthy child. And not only is it a healthy child, it's a male child, yeah. a boy. I, just, I love this storyline. It's so cool. Okay, so Hagar flees, and the Lord sends her back. Um, where did the Lord find her, and, and what's going on here? Who is this that comes uh, up here? Angel. Now we see the angel of the Lord. A new presentation of God to us through a new, a new theophany, they call this. The, the angel of the Lord, he found her. In um, found her. It says that he appeared to her in the wilderness. Now, that, you know, we can read pa past that, but what do you see in that? Think about the wilderness. Could, could he have just found her that easily? If you're out in the wilderness, you're not easily found, right? So already right off the, at the beginning of this um, presentation or this appearance of the angel of the Lord, we see him precisely finding her out there in the middle of nowhere, you know, and it, it, therefore, what does that tell you about who the angel of the Lord is? Jesus. It obviously is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, or it could also be the same idea as the burning bush or the the pillar of fire and the, the light, either way. Uh, I, most people uh, um, make the, make the um, conclusion that these theophanies of the Lord appearing in physical form as either an angel or a man, that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. I personally mark all of my angels of the Lord, if I know it's not just a angel, that it is Jesus. So this, so I always mark these in this way, the angel of the Lord, and I just put a cross on it, that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. A Christophany and a Theophany. This is, right, Theophany, it, can, it is, it's, it's the Lord, and is it, I mean, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it's, you know, the three-in-one God. And so I'm just telling you what most people assume that the angel of the Lord is Jesus but that can be it can you can see it from the perspective that it's simply God in a form of human uh, ability to see him it, he, what he does for us is he gives us a way that we can see him face to face without dying right 
So he appears in, in a form. Whether it's God the Father or Jesus in, a, in his pre-incarnate state, either way, it's still God. Right. Right. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. So he appears to her in the wilderness. He commands her to return. Right. So he has this authority. And it's the first thing he does is he puts her in a fire. Yeah. I love that. I love that. By the way, P.S. You are Sarah's maid. Just don't forget your place. That you, you know, that you don't get bigger than your britches. And kind of that is, in fact, what she did. And for whatever reason, she seemed to think that she had that right and that authority. And so she's in the wilderness pouting. She actually put herself in great danger because she goes out to a place where there's no water. There are thieves. There are bandits. Anybody could have found her and, you know, uh, abused her or whatever. And so she really was angry to go to that point. You know, it's like a woman who's angry and she gets in her car and drives off at 90 miles an hour in her car. Well, she's putting her life in danger by storming off in that way, and that's what we see Hagar doing. She's throwing a fit. Yes, it's a temper tantrum. But he commands her to return and uh, to submit to Sarah. So he he does put her back in her place. Um, Now, here comes another subject matter then in this, and this is the idea of slaves or servants in this manner where there's a, apparently an, a, possess- he, they own them. So we have the subject of slavery. I think it's kind of the first mention of this, isn't it, that we've had where we've seen slavery going on in this way? I'm not sure because I didn't pay attention to it before this. But here we definitely see the slavery thing. Now, what do you see God's view uh, in, it seems to be on this subject? Yes. Did that make you think of the, um, who, who was it? Was it in, not Philippians, Philemon. Thank you. That was the name I was rem- trying to remember. Do you remember Philemon? And he, and he said, look, he's now become useful to me, and I'm sending him back to you, and I, I would like it if you would let me have him so that I could, you know, because I would benefit from having him with me, but I'm not going to assume that you have that right. So even Paul literally worked within the system of slavery that was prevalent in the day. And do we still have slavery today? Around the world, yeah. Not in America, thankfully, anymore. Oh, yeah, well, yes, we do. But that, um, yes, I guess it is. But but it's not an accepted thing in our culture is what I'm saying. That's the kind of slavery I'm talking about, where it's the standard, the norm, and everyone. You know, and we, we have an awful lot of people right now going back in history and really critically um, just attacking everything about our ancient history without taking into mind the, the culture of the day, the context and the culture of the day. Thankfully, what America did was come out from under it. We recognized it was wrong and that, that it was not biblically the right thing to do. And so America, in you th- when you think of the time span that we had it, it was fairly short, and we came out of it. We, we abolished it. And it still is. Yeah. All around the world, there is still slavery going on everywhere. So what I'm saying here, though, is very interesting to me, is the Lord doesn't even address that. He literally says to her, go back and submit to your mistress. And, and in that, what he's literally more concerned about is her attitude, her behavior, her moral character, right? The way that she is uh, both, you know, really a lot of us, we have situations in our lives where we feel like we're under the thumb of someone, right? Sometimes it's a job, sometimes it's a bad marriage, sometimes it's just bad relationships with friendships. And God is literally saying to you and I, what? Right, okay, you have me, and therefore, yeah. It's not about how you feel about the, the mis the abuse that you've endured, or if you perceive it that way. And in this case, really, Hagar brought it on herself. 
because she entered into that apparently in agreement. I don't know what the uh, cultural standard was as far as the, the slave. Did she have a choice or not? I'm not sure on that part. Well, it could also be that what they're emphasizing there is that Sarah was in agreement on this, that it was Sarah's idea, and Sarah went to Abram and said, this is my great idea, let's do this. Um, and so it wasn't that Abram took a wife without Sarah's consent, she was consenting. I think that's the major point there. But how much control did Hagar have in that? I don't know, it doesn't tell us that. But what it does tell us is what Jesus says to her in the wilderness, if in fact the angel Lord is Jesus, but God tells her in the wilderness, Sarah, go back and submit to your mistress because I'm more concerned about your moral character and your living right before me than I am about the situation of you being a slave. <laughs> Interesting at that point, isn't it? That that's how God is working at this point in history. Do you think that means God's okay with slavery? No. No, it's just that that was what was going on in the time. It's like the polygamy. Did God rebuke um, Abram at all about the polygamy? Does he later take a couple more in? Yeah, yeah. He, he actually ends up with, I think, a total of four wives in the end. So um, am I getting the storyline right on that? Maybe I'm wrong, so don't quote me on that. I might. Billa and... Is that a different, it might be Jacob. I might have a different guy. It might be Jacob that has four. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad I, it kind of, all of a sudden went, oh, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't Abraham. Okay. I was wondering, and maybe this is a rabbit trail, but, you know, I looked at Hagar being wife. Yes. And maybe she was named just for this because. Right. They may have come up with that. Yes, and they gave them possessions. Well, you know, and the other thing is that, that quite likely is that Hagar was already a slave in Pharaoh's house, and when they sent Sarah back, they, gave, they sent gifts with him, and he may have said, take your handmaiden with you, the one I gave to you. Okay, let me, let me pull mine out, and we'll talk about that. She's asking about the tree uh, chart that we were to fill in, okay? When she gave us instructions for the tree way back, she said, as you come across the names, fill them in. in order. So it would be under Abram. Sarah would be all the way over here. Can you all see that? I'm not probably going to track Is this showing correctly on the video? Come back up a little bit. Okay, well, here's where you're putting them. Okay, you know what? There is another, there is going to be in chapter 25, another wife to Abram, Keturah. Yeah. Yeah, so there are three wives eventually. A lot. And what's interesting to me is he didn't learn his lesson. And yet, so he continues in this. And, and yet God doesn't rebuke him. God doesn't address it. Do you remember when we looked at a murder in the earlier part of the Genesis record, before the flood, before God instituted uh, so, uh, uh, judicial <laughs> laws and capital punishment for, for murder? People were doing things and just getting away with it, it seemed like. I mean, God put a mark on Cain. Oh, wow. Right? <laughs> I'm thinking, no, he deserves to die. He killed his brother, right? But God now in the New Testament, or I mean, uh, after the flood, not New Testament, after the flood, then God instituted laws that 
began to take care of that. But here we are in the patriarchal system here yet in the Old Testament, and it does seem like we have a lot of things going on. And these are interesting subjects to kind of mull over in your mind. How did God feel about slavery? How does he address it? If you did a topical subject study on that throughout the Old Testament, it would be a very interesting one to do to see how does he view it, what does, how does he deal with it. It seems like at least at this point, we're not seeing him even address it. It's like that's secondary. The more important thing to God is the relationship between Sarah and Hagar and how they're treating one another. And also understanding um, Hagar, the necessity for Hagar to understand her position that God places people in their positions in life. And have you ever considered that in your own life, that wherever you are in your station in life, however much wealth you have, whatever kind of a job you've had, whether you're married, not married, do you have children, do you not, are you one of the barren women you know, of our time? Um, all these things, who is the sovereign God Almighty over this, right? And do you recognize that in whatever station you have been placed, you're to honor God? And it seems like that is the emphasis that we're seeing. Are you finding that, that that's ringing true? Yes? Absolutely. Yeah. And slavery is a construct of mankind. It is. God. And it's a fallacy, and God will eventually you know, help us to rectify that, at least in America. But what we see in the Old Testament as it continues on, even all the way into the New Testament with Paul addressing it, right? All right, so this is your, these are your chart. So you should have, uh, Abraham is the, uh, up here on this very first line. Then next to it is Sarah, who gets a new name, Sarah. And then Hagar is next to her. So I, uh, this one I have, um, Sarah is 1129, so that's how we get her first, her first introduction to us in, is in Genesis 11, verse uh, 29. Then right next to her I wrote Hagar, and that's in 16.3, where Hagar becomes wife. What is the total gender count for the children based on wife on this Because in the eyes of God, who's wife? Okay. I think that's why. Because Hagar... Even if she is wife, and she is, because the text tells us that, it isn't, it isn't wife in the eyes of the Lord. God, you get one, in God's definition of marriage back in Genesis 2, what is marriage? One man and one woman. I think that's why. Okay, and then underneath we see Sarah with Isaac, and we have Hagar with Ishmael. And then, so Isaac is, 20, is going to be 21, verse 3, eventually. You're going to get there. The, uh, the next to it under Hagar is Ishmael, and that's 16, 15. So does that help you with your tree part to get you started? You can see by looking at this chart here, look at all the stuff that's in there. You're going to be getting... Say it what is the question? How come we don't see Esau and Jacob listed under um, Isaac? Oh, that, yeah, we're not in that part of the storyline yet. It would really make this too, too, really crazy. Yeah, no, it's too much information on one chart. It's, do you remember a couple of weeks ago I talked about all the maps that I've been looking at? And every time we get to a new little narrative, I have to get another map because each map kind of addresses certain areas, certain cities or whatever, um, but from the perspective of that storyline, right? So that's the same thing I think about this chart here. Right now we're looking at it from the perspective of where we are in our narrative with Abraham. They, they would, I don't know. Maybe we're getting there. Maybe, I don't know. We, listen, we're getting to chapter 22, it looks like, a lot of this, and then in 25, um, that's where a lot of those are going to be, chapter 22 and 25, and we're not there yet. But when we get there, you're going to fill this in. Okay, I can't explain everything. You know what, I didn't write the curriculum. All I'm doing is trying to be obedient. I only have 40 minutes left, and we got a lot, of, a lot to ground to cover. 
Okay, I also have on my chart that will be going out to you when we're done with this, the third page, I have a couple of maps for you that I think are helpful. One is that shows Hagar where she headed to when she went out into the wilderness. It's just interesting to see. And then the other one is about Sodom and Gomorrah, where Sodom and Gomorrah is on the map visibly, where you can see where it's at. And he's at the Oaks of Mamre, which are right signified by a little tree. And then where, he, where he's going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah, the angel of the Lord, that we're going to get into that part that it's on this map. So it gives you a map to look at if you're interested. Okay, let's move along. Let's get, let's get going. We got a lot to cover. Seven to nine. Now we've got uh, 10, 10 to 12. And what do we see here? We see the angel of the Lord in conversation, yes. 10 to 12. Speaking to Agar, and what do we see the Lord presented to us in this? How is he presented to us in this segment? What are we told about the Lord? Because we're trying to d define our understanding of who God is also. He's the God who sees. So here's Hagar out, out in the wilderness, and it says the angel of the Lord comes to her. So he appears to her. First thing he does is rebuke her. It says, I want you to go back and submit to Sarah. Then he goes on and he says, but, but, I want you to know something else. So he rebukes and then he follows it up with what? Well, Exhortation or a blessing or if there's a soothing balm placed over that wound, right? He lets her know that she matters. Now tell me, why is this important for us in this story? Because what has been, our, what is the major focus in our storyline here? Whose lineage, where are we headed? Isaac. Through Isaac. But what is this little deviation doing for us? God cares for all of us. There you go. God cares for everyone. Yes, he has an agenda. Yes, he has a plan. Yes, Israel is special. Yes, they are blessed of God. Yes, they have been given the, the, the law of God and the, and the temple service and all these special things, right? God is going to do a work through them specifically. But everything is being done, even through the one that's the chosen in the regard to the specific part of the plan. They're chosen to accomplish God's will and God's purpose, right? But does that leave anyone and everyone else out of the picture? And the answer is no. In this, when he goes to her, God gives her a, a word of comfort, right? And it tells her that what is God, how is God described here? The angel Lord, and, and how is it defined? That what does God do? How is he, what's the different, what is the information you learn about God in these verses? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you look up the word Ishmael, did y'all look up Ishmael's name? He tells her, name your son, you're going to have a son. So now she knows what gender her baby's going to be. So there's a supernatural insight. So this, again, affirms to us this is not just an angel. This is God speaking because God is the one who knows. He sees the womb. Um, he says, and you're going to call his name Ishmael. And what does Ishmael's name mean? God will hear. God will hear. So God hears. Oh, i got to get a different marker. Sorry, this one dried out while I talked too long. Okay, so God hears. Um, Hagar, oh, can't remember her name. Okay, and besides hearing her, what? And what else does God do? What does he also say? She goes in there and says to us about um, the fact that he found her, he located her, he knew where to go. We, so what does that show us about God? He's watching us. He sees us. He sees every one of us individually. I think that's a really, for me, that was an important point. Now, it gets reaffirmed in the next segment part, which, which is 13 to 16, where he literally says about um, the well where she's found. It's Kadesh, at Kadesh and Bered. Then she names it Bir Alahai Roy. I'm, I'm probably saying that really badly. But wh when you look that up, by definition, what does that say? What is the definition of that? 
Uh, well of the living one who sees me. So does that fit with what we see here? Moreover, the angel of the Lord said, I will great, greatly multiply you. He says he, he came to her in the wilderness in 7 to 9. So he sees these. God hears Hagar and God sees Hagar. I'm kind of pulling it down a little bit, but I, I felt like it was an important point to bring forward at, in the uh, in the unfolding story of this because I felt like what we're missing here in this, in this narrative is the picture of God in it if we don't uh, insert some information about what it is that God is trying to teach us about himself. So we know that God sees and we know that God hears. He hears Hagar. He sees Hagar. So he's not only interested in Sarah and Abram and their child that they will have, but he's also interested in Hagar. Now, I can't say that I feel like all the news he gave to her about her son was all that great. <laughs> I'm going, thanks, God, for this rotten kid you're going to give me. <laughs> because he, he foretells the son's character, right? What is, how does he wild describe? Donkey. A wild donkey of man. I had one of those. My son's a wild donkey of a man. Yes, I mean, I love him greatly, but he was as stubborn as they come. Uh, strong will, right? Now that can be good if it can be molded, right? But it's not fun to raise. <laughs> and it says his hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. And also what? He's going to eat. So, so lots of information in here. This is, this is forth telling, yes. right? It's prophetic foretelling of who this child will be. First of all, he's going to be a boy. You're going to name him Ishmael. He's going to be extremely stubborn, and everybody's going to hate him. <laughs> and he's going to live in a specific land, which is east to his brothers. Very cool. I mean, that's a lot of information. So uh, 10 to 12, it says then, am I in the right segment, 10 to 12? Yeah, OK. Um, somehow I put that information in the wrong place. That one goes down below. Um, in, so that was Ishmael. Name him, Ishmael, and that was um, 3458, and it's God will hear, which is how I got this title, okay, that God will hear. Okay, then in 13 to 16. This will close us out. It seems like there's a lot of emphasis in here on the God, the fact that she sees God. Yes. So how did you title it? Well, how would you title it if you had done that? Because <laughs> I know some of you didn't get to that place probably. What is she most amazed about? That she didn't die. She saw God and she didn't die. So what does that tell us we know that she knew? He God. That he was God and that if you see God, you will die. And so she's just amazed that she gets to see God and she doesn't die. She's a little, a little confused by this almost. It's almost like, what? How, do, how is it that I can see God and not die? So what do we Yes, that's what I feel like is the strongest part of why I feel like this is a Christology or a, it's a pre-incarnate presence of Christ because she's saying, I'm seeing God and I'm not dying. He comes in the form, in this case, in the form of the angel of the Lord. So it's an angel form, but it's also somewhat human. And we're going to see this again when we move on into 18 as well. But in here then, what we see... As a t for a title is that uh, Hagar sees God and what? And doesn't die. Hagar sees God and does not die. She's, she's amazed at that. So she's amazed. Um, there is a verse in Exodus. Somebody go to Exodus 33, uh, verse 20.
And what do we learn later in scripture that, that, that confirms what, what she's saying here? But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Wow. So God literally will tell us later in black and white in the pages of the word of God that no man can see God and live. And we, we all know that story about Moses and being put in the cleft of the rock and how God passes by and he sees his back but he can't see his face and so forth. And so this is another one of those that you uh, cannot see my face. No one may see me and live. That's, that's really. So what is the impression there then? Why? Why, not, why are we not able to see the Lord? This is why I used to kind of laugh at my son when he'd say, if God had just show up in my living room, then I'd be believe it. I'm like, oh, no. He's holy. And it, he cannot stand in the presence of sin. And this is why the brokenness of relationship that we have with God right now, I mean, he used to walk in the garden with Adam and Eve and converse with them and have conversation with them. But after the sin, he broke that relationship off, letting us know. It's not that, that um, God could not have allowed it, but he chose not to. Why? What does it do for you and I if we had a conversation about this yesterday at church also. What do you do with people who are sinning in the church, in the church, that claim to be a Christian and they're doing overt sin and you approach them and you approach them and you approach them and you do it biblically in the correct way and they still won't repent. And then what do you do to them? You take the, you cast them out of the church because why? What are you hoping to do? turn them around. You're hoping that they miss your fellowship. They miss the presence of that, that righteous um, presence of God and the light and the goodness and the, the sweet, sweet fellowship. And if they will miss it enough, they'll turn from their sin and return to, and return to have that fellowship with the body of Christ. Right? So this is what God did to Adam and Eve. He says, you will not see me and live as long as you're in sin. So now what he's done is he's made a way for us to approach him. In the Old Testament, it was still by faith, which is what we're seeing with Abraham. Um, but eventually, not in this life, but in the life to come, we will be reunited with God in that sweet, sweet fellowship. So the interim in between is us saying to God, we desire that. We long for that. And we are so sorry that we have failed you. We are so sorry that we have sinned. And that's what God wants. We want that from people if you have to cast them out of church fellowship as well. You want them to long for that fellowship so that they will repent and then come back. It isn't to cast them out to be mean. It's not to say, well, we don't want you around. We do want you around. But you cannot stay in the presence of a holy God and live in, in sin willfully. Right? Okay, so that's... Mm -hmm. And he wants you back. He's drawing her back. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's a, it, yeah. And so there's so much richness to this. And I know we're going to have to hurry through the next two chapters. I'm not going to get as deep in it. But can you see what happens when you slow down and you do the research? You see those word studies. You contemplate the actual scenario. You met, this is what God talks about, meditating day and night on the word, right? It, as you meditate on these things, there is a depth and a rich um, message in there for you and I personally in our lives. How do we treat one another? How, how could they have missed, how could they have avoided this whole mess to begin with so that we wouldn't have those next two chapters, right? We would just go straight into the, the, the promised son and, and it would all be great, right? But what, what is this showing us about a man in our relationship to God? What are you learning?
learning about who we are. We're yes, we are. We are impatient. We, we, think, do it we think that we need the help. Yeah, we need to help God out a lot. He needs help because he doesn't quite know what he's doing, obviously. Right? What would he do with a 90-year-old woman who's barren? Okay, so let's move into 17. Okay. Oh, title it. Yeah, let's title it. Not what you have. Because now it's all like Hagar, 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 Hagar. Okay. But ultimately, in the end, at the conclusion, it's all about what happens concerning Hagar. She has Ishmael. So we start with Abraham marries Hagar. Hagar conceives, and she despises Sarah because of it. She flees, and the Lord sends her back. And then God hears her, God sees her, and God sees, uh, Hagar sees God and does not die. And so in this, in this narrative, what we're seeing is this, re this relationship that they developed out of their own willfulness to get ahead of God and their lack of faith and impatience and so forth. But in the end, what is, in, if you're looking at people, places, and events, what's the major event here? Ishmael. Ishmael, yeah. <laughs> this tells us then that you could say the birth of Ishmael. Now, if you like another title, that's fine. It's just that in, in the, the unfold, if you look at your at-a-glance chart, though, and you're looking for major events that help you to understand where you're at in the flow of the conversation, by titling this, this is where Ishmael is born, you're going to see this whole story and understand it was not God's desire for Ishmael to be born. I mean, although he was, obviously, God allowed her to conceive in the womb. He allows man to do what then? What else do you learn about that? What does God allow man to do? Free will. Yeah, have free will and make mistakes. And he lets them live with their mess. Yes. Because what, what is the best teacher of all things that, ha that we do? What is the best teacher? Our, our experience of, of through our mistakes. I think we learn more through our mistakes than we do through doing it right, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. So here's one of those experiences where God records for us, and he says, this is where they went wrong. Abraham failed. Sarah's scathingly brilliant idea was not brilliant at all. I had a plan. It's marriage, one man, one woman. I promised Abraham a seed, an heir. He should have assumed it would be an heir of his own wife, right? But he, he doesn't seem to get that, not even until now. So now we're in Genesis 17, and we're going to look at, um, I don't know if my ink will write. I'll start with this color here. Uh, let's go. Verses 1 and 2 is an introduction of a new name for God. What do we see? God Almighty. God Almighty. And what did God Almighty do? But, he, but what did he, in verses 1 and 2, what does he do? What, is the, what does it say? He, Abram is 99 years and what? The Lord, the Lord appears to Abram. And now it goes on, he says, and then he goes on to explain who the Lord is. He appeared to Abram and he said to him, I am God Almighty. So the Lord is God Almighty. So it, it, it yokes those two titles together. So what we see then is God Almighty appeared to Abram. Now in this narrative th that we have in this segment of Genesis is going to show us why that title is significantly used and why it is for the first time used in the unfolding of the Genesis record. Why in Genesis 17 is God Almighty going to be significant? So let's do a word study on God Almighty. Um, the first is God. Then it's almighty. So what is God? Number 430. And almighty is number 7706. So there are two parts to this. And what is it? How does it translate? Did anybody do a word study on this? Oh, OK. Well, I'll give it to you then. Ah, there you go. Okay, there we go. My definition is mighty one, most powerful. 
Any others? Yes, ultimate power over all. Oh, very interesting. The breast and the mountain thing, right? Yes. Yeah, I, re I read that too, and I thought that's interesting because what it's doing is sim through symbolic symbolism, it's making an impression upon you about something. M my, um, I think it was my biblical languages dictionary. It says uh, its precise meaning is uncertain, but it says it is always associated with God's promises of children. I thought that was interesting. So let me give you the three or four verses here where you can go look at this. 28.3, 35, 11, 43, 14, and 48.3. Do you need me to repeat that? Uh-huh. 28.3, 35, 11, 43, 14, and it does go on to say, as what Kathy said, focuses on the power to complete promises. Just like on, on the, the one, uh, the, uh, was it Lord? or it, it's the word Jehovah, and the focus is on the covenantal relationship with his people. And this one, is it focuses on his power to complete promises. So it's all about his power, okay? And then it says he, he appeared. So, it's gonna, so this is God Almighty. That's the first word study. Let's do this one on appeared. He appeared to Abram, 7,200. It literally just means to become visible. So it's, vi it's visibility, but in a form or a way that God is allowed to be seen, but not what? Not going to kill the person who's looking. <laughs> okay. So he, and he says, walk before me and be blameless. Now, have we seen that instruction in any other places? Where, who does that remind you of? Noah, that he walked with God, right? So the idea of blamelessness is, is not meaning what then? If we know the story of Noah, who came off that ark and got drunk, and it does not mean sinless, guys. Blameless does not mean perfection, okay? It does not mean that. So did anybody do a word study on blameless? I'm just going to, I'm not going to do the whole thing up on the board. 549. It literally just means having integrity, okay? Um, he says, and then I will, he goes on in verses 1-2 to say, I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. So he repeats to a Abram at this point that he is this covenant with him. I am God Almighty. I'm going to establish my covenant between me and you, and he's going to tell him how he's going to establish it. This is not going to be too much fun for poor Abram, but he's letting him know there's going to be a, a sign of this covenant. So yeah, that one and two, God Almighty appears. Then the next segment starts in three and goes to eight. And what's going on in the next part of this? By the way, when I said this, that he appeared, he becomes visible. God has shown himself as fire, as clouds, but here it's nondescript. Okay, it doesn't explain to us. It just says it's nondescript. But Abram knew who he was engaged with. He understood. And when God finished, and when you get down in 22, it says, and he went up. So whatever it was, it was a physical appearance. Okay? Just so you understand that. I don't know if that's super important, but... Okay, what do we see in th going on in 3 to 8? Basically, again, he states his promise. Yeah, he reaffirms the covenant. And he does so by doing what? What is, how does he affirm it? Yeah, he changes Abraham's name. Okay, students of mine who have done covenant, why is that significant? 
Why is a name change significant in this passage? What is a name change associated with? I got married and I became Mrs. It's Phillips. It's a new identity and it's associated with covenant making. Covenant making, one of the qualities or characteristics of covenant making, often making, often is a change of name or the giving of a new name. Did you notice in the last chapter where she named the well, the God who sees me, or right, uh, um, well of the living one seeing me? And so that was a, a name that she gave that place. Why? Because, because again, it's, it's another one of those signs of, has to do with covenant making. And in this one, it seems like I, I might be st stretching it a little bit, but she's literally giving honor to God in the fact that he appeared to her and he gave her a promise. He made her promises, right? And she's recognizing that by, by making a, a new name for this well, giving this well a name, and naming it in honor of what, what occurred there, that she saw the living God and didn't die, right? And that he had made these promises to her. So here we see Abram is going to be given a new name. So Abram... So he reaffirms it by giving him a new name, okay? And the name change is a common practice in covenant making. What does Abram mean? Did you look it up? Abraham? Number 85, and it means, uh, do you think, does it say that, exalted father? Okay, Abraham is father, yes, of a multitude. It could be nations also. So literally, he hasn't done this for, for Abram yet. He doesn't have a nation or a, he isn't a father of a multitude yet, but he's reaffirming the covenant promise that he's going to give him an heir and descendants and a land to live on, right? And he's reaffirming that by naming him, you're a father of a multitude. So I'm going to walk around town. I'm a father of a multitude. Really, Abram? Where is your child? You know, right? <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> I, think that's in, I think it's really fun, the, the humor sometimes in the word of God and how God does these things. Okay. So then the next thing that happens is he says, I'm going to give you a new name. And then... He gives a sign of this covenant, right? And what is it? Yeah. And again, we're just reaffirming this is a personal relationship. Remember when we talked about this particular covenant? It's a personal relationship, so it, it's entered one by one by one. Not in You don't get in because you're part of the family. You get in by faith in the same way that Abraham did. He believed God, was reckoned to him as righteousness. And now what we're seeing, though, is he's, 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 um, he's giving a sign to the covenant, but is it because of circumcision that you enter this covenant? How did Abraham enter this covenant? By faith. By faith. So let's talk about the, the progression of timing here. Abraham enters Canaan. He's 75 years old, right, when he first comes into the land of Canaan. I think that was back in chapter 11 or 12, right? Then we see in 15 the covenant is made. It doesn't give us the age of Abram at that time, but we know that he's on the land for about 10 years uh, it, before Isaac is born. Isaac then is born... Um, about 11 years later than after entering the land. And he is 80, Abram was 86 was years old. Oh, Ishmael. Yes, sorry, not Isaac. You're right, Ishmael. I typed it wrong. I gotta, write, I gotta fix that. Okay. <laughs> um, um, about 11 years old. Okay, so Abraham was um, 86 years old. That's seen in Genesis 16.3 and 16.16. 16. Okay. 
Then, <laughs> I did it twice, Ishmael is circumcised at the age of 13 years old, and now Abram is 99. So the covenant, the, the sign of the covenant, the covenant was made back when Abram was somewhere between 75 and 85 years of age. He's now 99 years old and is given this sign of the covenant. Okay, so you don't get, in this case, saved, right, because he's credited as righteousness for believing God. You don't get saved by circumcision. You get saved by believing and then later, and isn't that amazing how many years God put between making that covenant with him and then giving the sign of the covenant. Do you think God was deliberate and intentional in that? What is it that we have today that might be equivalent to this idea of circumcision in our new covenant? Baptism. baptism. How many people often are confused about the idea that baptism is what saves, that you have to get saved? I know there are some denominations that literally teach that, that if you don't get baptized, you're not saved, right? So what God did by doing this for us is demonstrate that signs of a covenant, the, the traditional um, practices of covenant making are not what save you. Those traditions like a new name or getting baptized, those are the result of being in covenant. You enter covenant by faith, in this case, this covenant is entered by faith, and then you can have the signs and, of, that might accompany that covenant. So in this one little short chapter, we get two signs of a covenant, a new name and circumcision. Okay, 17 to four, uh, 14. All right, I'm not going to write all that down. So we're going to move on then to 16 to 21. I missed a verse. Maybe it should be 15. <laughs> 15? Okay. Yep, 15. I, I did a lot of... Oh, okay, it is, it, it is right, 15, okay. Okay, so 15 to 16? 15 and... 15 and I'm in 17. 15 and 16 is my next one because it's a new subject. What is your majorly... Uh, Keyword marked uh, in verse 15 and 16. Sarah, 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 Sarah. Oh, so who do you think this particular two little, two sentences is about? Sarah. And what happens to Sarah? She gets a new name. Sarah gets a new name. Sarah is also given a new name. Now, if we know that, that a new name is associated with covenant making, new name, with covenant making, what is the, the new name that's most obvious to you and I in today's world, that we, where we get a new name when we enter a covenant? Marriage. Marriage, right. right? So it's very easy for us once you make that uh, uh, parallel observation, you go, oh yeah, that's right. When you make a covenant, you often get a new name. That's the, what they did back then as well. So it's associated with covenant making. So this is interesting. What does this tell you then? If she's also given a new name, she's part of that covenant, part of that covenant and she has apparently entered it also by faith mm -hmm. because he, she would not get a new name if she had not believed either even though we're seeing a lot of ups and downs on that believing, both of them, right? They believe God and then they don't. They believe God and then they don't. Uh, it sounds like a normal uh, life journey with walking with God of our frailties and our inability often to wait on God and be patient for God and to, to completely believe God all the time. But, but there has apparently been a place and a time in Sarah's life where she did believe God because she's apparently in covenant with him. He is giving her a new name. That is our indicator. She's in covenant with God as well. Okay? And, and putting them both together almost side by side in this way, make sure that you make that connection. This is the covenant. I'm reaffirming it. Abram, you, this is your name. Sarah, this is your new name. Okay? Uh, now, I have a whole section here for you. Let me just read a little bit. New names. Abraham. 
for he'll be the father of many nations. And his new name is that promise again. So his name literally means father of a multitude, right? Um, God informs Sarah, uh, Abraham that Sarah will indeed bear a son for him, right? So th that's what we see. In Sarah is given a new name, and this is assuring her of something. Assuring her what? Yeah. She will uh, have a son. That heir that was promised. And again, in the name, God gives her that assurance. So what does her name mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't have I don't have my numbers here. Does anybody have that number for Sarah? No? Okay, that's okay. We'll just put a definition out. Sarah means um, S-A-R-A-H is the new name. It means princess. Uh, it's re it reinforced that God will keep his long-awaited promise of an heir. Receiving a new name symbolized their new identity and relationship with God. When you and I become Christians, we take on that name Christian, and th that affixes us to who? Christ. Christ. That's our new name. We, ha we are Christians. And we also saw in uh, Revelation where it says that he's going to write a, a new name on a stone for us one day. when we, It's going to be one of our rewards. Um, taking a new name is still a common part of covenant making. Now, what was added on their names for both of them is um, H-A and A-H are added added to their names. And what they say here is this. The hermeneutics, the biblical hermeneutics dictionary says this. Now, as the only change in each name is made by the insertion of a single letter and that the letter is the same in both of their names, him and her both, I cannot help concluding that some mystery was designed by its insertion and therefore the opinion of Clarius and some others, I don't know who Clarius is, another commentary writer, uh, is not to be disregarded, which supposes this, that God shows he had conferred a, conferred a particular dignity on them both by adding to their names one of the letters of his own. You know that tetragrammaton where it drops out the vowels? It says his own name, a name by which his eternal power and authority are particularly <coughs> pointed out. In the word, in the title, uh, Lord, Yahweh, which is Jehovah, the I am, the, the definition of that is that, that God is the, the, uh, the all-powerful God, right? The, the God who can do anything. And so he's saying that both of them were allowed to receive a part of God's name into their name, and I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, uh, you know, it's a little bit of... Uh, kind of guessing because the scripture doesn't actually say it to us but the reality is the H-A and the A-H are added to both of their names identically and so being that that is part of God's name Lord that's interesting and especially if it's covenant making if you're a Christian and you take on the name Christ in this case they are belonging to Yahweh or the Lord and they're taking on part of the name of the Lord and it's a logical reasoning way to get there so you know I just thought it was very interesting so that's on your sheet you can do some re I gave you at the top of this last sheet where the uh, maps are there's a website that you can go into the hermeneutics on this and read more. It'll give you a little more detail. Okay, so Sarah's given a new name, assuring her that she's going to uh, be the one who will have that son. This is the first time now where she is told, you will have Sarah will have the heir. Oh, gosh. Oh, no. No, don't tell me that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
uh, 17 to 21. So you all want to just keep covering this information rather than doing the video. This is going to be hard for those who are online, especially if they have other commitments. Now, the advantage on. is you can come back later when you have time and finish listening to this class, and I'm sorry. I knew this was going to be a problem because... Be fair, this hasn't happened in like three or four weeks. So oh, three or four weeks? Is that all? Really well, I... <laughs> yeah, I mean, Revelation, we did it a lot because there were, you know, it's crazy. But, you know, if you really want to thoroughly cover these chapters, it does take a lot longer. Um, I hate to just drop you off at the end of 17 and not finish. Oh, the three men. You like those three men story. Okay, so you all decide what you need to do, and if you need to come back later and watch been good but thank you for joining us this morning for the amount of time and Kristen will keep recording and for those who want to stay and finish with us you can do that right now you have to go home and watch it and that's fine for those of you who need to go you you please do that all right so now let's cover uh we're, let's see we're in 17 and we've gotten to to 22 actually all right so Sarah's given a new name. Then what happens next? He gives, an, he gives an explicit understanding of who the heir is, the chosen one, the one who has been prophesied and promised, right? So what does he tell us here in 17 to 22? The covenant heir is going to be Isaac, not Ishmael. Yeah, the, God's covenant will be established with Isaac. Okay. Uh, Abraham was concerned for Ishmael, however, right, in, this, in, the, in the narrative. And so what does God tell him concerning uh, Ishmael? He's going to bless him. But... But this is not the child through which I'm... Now, can you at this point determine why you think that this is so? Why is it that God is making sure that we understand it's Isaac? How did Ishmael come about? <laughs> Not in the way God would have done it. First of all, they, there was polygamy involved and all these other issues that really should not have happened. Um, and not only that, but the reason God chose Sarah to begin with is why? Because she was barren. And therefore, the work of it, the end of it, would be that God would uh, do a supernatural thing, right? Um, also, there's another thing that I thought of, of in my research on this about the idea that God chooses. He knows the hearts and the thoughts of man. So why does he choose Isaac rather than Ishmael? Why not Ishmael? Well, part of it has to do with the heart, right? We have already seen how God described the, the character of what Ishmael will be like, and we know the outcome of, through history, the outcome of the nations of those people on the whole are not those who love the Lord, those that are not walking with God. They don't have faith and belief in Jesus Christ on the whole. And so I think that partly just the fulfillment the, the unfolding of history shows us one reason why God did not choose Ishmael was because Ishmael was not one who followed God. Um, the other thing I thought about was in Romans 14, also Romans, um, is it 9? 9, 10, and 11 is the sovereignty of God and his choosing. And one of the things that you have to understand is that God chooses through the plan. He had already laid down the plan. The plan would be the seed that God would, would bring about through the bloodline of Abraham. But first he would start with the seed of the son, who would be the heir. And the son would be a supernatural birth because it leads to a supernatural savior. Yes. Right? All right. So if you want to, you can go back and, first of all, Galatians 3.15 again tells us that Jesus is the seed that was actually promised, right? And then Romans 14, 1 through 14, and Romans 10, 10 is going to kind of wrap that up. It's he chooses us by his plan. That's how we're chosen in Christ. 
Ephesians chapter 1. How are we chosen in Christ Jesus, in him, through him, by him, for him, right? So he is the plan. So by his plan and belief in the promised seed, that's the plan by which we are chosen. So we're not just chosen arbitrarily. I'm not just picked out because Katie's so great. I'm picked out because Katie believed God's plan. Katie believed God's word concerning who the seed would be and that the seed is Christ. So putting my faith and belief that Jesus is in fact that fulfilled promise of the seed, that's how I'm chosen. I'm chosen by believing God, okay? And then the seed then promised Abraham was then in fact Jesus. So you can go back and read those those passages. In Romans, that whole segment division about the sovereignty of God and who are you, old man, that you should uh, argue with God or, or challenge God on, is God right? Is God good? Does he choose correctly? Does, does he make the right choices? And um, it's like, of course he does, right? But God gets to choose, but the way God chose is through the plan. Okay. All right. Now, 23 to 27. What did Abraham do? He laughed. He laughed. <laughs> Abram laughed, but although he laughed, then what did he also do? That very same day, he obeyed God. He was circumcised. Abraham and all those with him were circumcised. That very day. Now, this leads to another possibility of study, a line of study. Um, is about the evidence of true faith. Now, we know that it's not by works that we're saved, right? But what is the evidence that, in fact, you are saved? Obedience. Your works, you, yeah. the, the things that you do. You can't say to a person, go, be well fed, but not give them anything to help them out, right? That's what James teaches. So faith is lived out and proven true by the works of obedience to God. So that's what we see demonstrated. So it's a, the first picture for us of the idea that, no, you aren't saved. The, this is a reaffirming of the covenant. The covenant was promised back in chapter 15. He entered that covenant by faith um, all those years back. But now we are forward in history, at least 13 years or so. And now God is giving them a sign of the covenant, not to be confused with the belief to enter it, but a sign of it so that it would be a remembrance. And by the way, why circumcision? She asked you those questions. Okay, there's blood shed. Uh -huh. What is the specific promise that he's promising him here that we're looking at? Has to do with what? About a seed. Where's the seed going to come from? It, the cut is made at the closest place to the site of the covenant promise. And what it does, now if you stop and think about this in history, we're way back, we're talking about in his day, a seed that's going to come pretty soon. It's his firstborn son, Isaac, right? The one that's going to come for him, the covenant son, I should say. Um, but ultimately, when Abram believed God, what did he believe God for? Was it for that son, Isaac? No, Galatians said it was for the seed who is Christ. Yes. Therefore, by instituting this sign to the Jewish people specific, they would then have circumcision at the site of the place through which God would bring a seed. And every generation, year by year by year, would constantly be reminded as they both go through the process of circumcision, but also daily visibly see that yes. mark of circumcision and that would be a reminder to them that what God is bringing a seed in through this nation at some point in history now he doesn't give us the win on that but at some point and we now know it because in hindsight we have the answer to that but that's why circumcision it was pragmatic it was it was associative it helped them to again it was a visual picture to remind them in the same way that this was a, a visible thing for them to be given new names 
I am the father of many princes, or of a multitude, right? He said, uh, of a multitude. I am a princess, because later he says, and from her would come kings and kings of kings, right? Nations of kings. So he names her princess to remind her kings are going to come from you. And for him, a multitude, so that he remembers that a multitude will come from him. That multitude really points forward to the real seed eventually. All right. All right, that's 17. Excellent. Now we're ready for 18. We need to title, I guess. Um, in Genesis 17, uh, this is, culminates in the idea of circumcision, right? You could also say sign of circumcision and new names if you wanted to as well. You could add that in there if you wanted to put that up there. Okay? 18, 1 to 8. Again, we have another appearance, right? The Lord appeared. And when the Lord appeared, what did Abraham do? What did Abraham call himself, as a matter of fact? In verse 3. I am your servant. So what we see in those first eight verses is a, is a rapidly moving record of what happens when this Lord... By the be did you happen to mark all of the things that Abraham did? I made a list on it. First of all, it introduces you to the fact that it's in the heat of the day, right? Okay, it's hot. If you've ever been to those arid, dry places or in the desert, and you're, it's in the heat of the day. Okay, so it's in the heat of the day. And what does he do? He ran to the tent door to meet them. And he did what? He bowed to them. And he said to them, I'm your servant. Right? So what does this tell you right off the bat? He recognizes that it's not just three men. Right? These, there are these people, there are these men that are coming. Three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran. <laughs> he knew immediately that this was something beyond human visitation. This was something else. And he literally says, I am your servant. Please let a little water be brought to wash your feet and to rest yourselves under the tree. I will bring a piece of bread <laughs> that you may refresh yourselves so that you may go on your way after, since you have visited your servant. And they said, oh, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried to the tent to Sarah and quickly repair three measures of fine flour. So he says three measures. That tells you there are three men, okay? So there's the Lord and two angels with him. Um, and we know that it's the Lord because the narrative is going to tell us this. So he hurries to the tent, make the, get those three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. Abram also ran to the herd. He took a tender choice calf, and he gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf which he had and prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. He was ready to serve. Yeah? Was that the servant No, it was Abram is preparing. He went to the servant. For, well, part of the, the servant did part of it apparently. But it says he did it and then he served them and he stood by the table while, while they ate. He brought them the bread. He brought them the milk and the curds. Yes, because he stood. You know, what does that mean? If you are serving somebody that you think is really important, and you, and you, have you ever been at a fancy restaurant? And they stand just like this. What are they doing? They're watching to see if they need anything else. Why? They're important. I'm going to make sure if I see they need the salt shaker and they can't reach it, I can run over there and hand it to them. That would be me. I need the salt shaker. Okay. Um, Okay, so I made a list on this. Abram hurried to them. He hurried back to the tent. He ran to the, to the herd. He, 
he had his servant hurry. He bowed down low before them. He, wa he brought water to wash their feet. He served them freshly baked bread. He had a choice calf killed, and he, the curds and the milk were provided, and he stood while they were eating. So the impression here is what? That, they un that he understood the significance of who they were and the significance of their appearance, right? That it was, why do you think that there was this appearance? What does the Lord tell him in the next part of this? Yeah, and Abraham's, uh, I'm going to put this, it was, and this was the, I'm going to do this. There's an angel. It's a funny angel. And then the third one is Jesus, okay? So these three, these three men appeared. He serves them in haste, quickly, with lots of attention. He recognizes their significance. Then it says in um, 9 to 15, they give her, him this news. So the reason for showing up is what? <laughs> to tell him, you are going to have a son. Why do you think that was important for the Lord to physically? Why didn't he just appear in a dream or a vision? What would be the difference in your thinking between a personal visit and a vision? Well, that's true. But if you knew it was a real vision from the Lord, what would be the difference between a, a vi having a vision versus the Lord actually appearing? A personal visit means you're important. Okay. You're a yeah. You take your time out to go. To right. Visit. If the president shows up at your door, visit, rather than making a phone call, do you think there's a difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think is the reason behind the Lord doing this? Okay. There's that, that, that other people would also notice it. What else? And there was a, a real significant or profound event that took place there too, right? Because what he did is he rebukes her, he sends her back, he puts her in her place, and he says, don't worry, I am going to bless your, your son. But then he goes on to tell Abram, but that's not the seed that I'm going to bless through. I'm going to affirm my covenant or establish my covenant through your son who will come from Sarah, right? So what he does in that appearance is he corrects a misstep on the part of Abram who was trying to thwart the plan of God and that might be misunderstood if he didn't come and make that correction, right? Now he's showing up in, in a way as a follow-up, I think, possibly, to that first showing up to Hagar, but now he's showing up to Abram and he's saying to Abram what? Where's Sarah? Sarah, your wife. Now he uses that word wife. He didn't do that with Hagar. Before he called Hagar Sarah's maid. So he's making sure that you, he understands it is Sarah that's going to have this child. And he comes in person because how, how profoundly important is this that both Sarah and Abraham understand that this is the one that's going to be the, the covenant child. This is the promised heir I've been t telling you about. Can you see the significant the significance of it is he does it in person. He makes a personal appearance to make sure that Abraham understands and clearly knows this is the child I was promising you all these years. How many years has it been since Genesis 11 and 12? 25, 26 years, something like that, right? It's been a, lo it's been a long time. And he's had some bumps along the way where they've been trying to help God out and not being sure why and you know at one point Sarah went with Pharaoh and God had to rescue her and I mean there were some real issues that have been going on so God shows up in this moment to make a personal appearance to make it absolutely clear that they understand this is the heir I promised isn't that interesting
Yes. Yes. So the Lord and two angels. Two angels. Mm-hmm. Well, they are appearing with him. They come with him. They're going to inspect the town, and then they're, they're taken up later. And they appear as men. Again, that's how we're talking about it. This is the really fun thing about how this prog- uh, progressive unfolding picture that God is giving us about spiritual matters and, and the spiritual influences of angels and how God works. Uh, how, you know, in this case, what we're seeing is you can't see God and live, so he's got to appear in various forms and shapes. He takes them on for specific purposes. We looked in chapter 15 at those, uh, at the covenant that he cut with Abraham, and there were the animals and how the animals and the birds, and then the, the pot and the, the fire that went through the, the cut pieces of flesh and how all that had symbolics. So God uses symbolisms in, from this life that we understand, and he uses them to convey messages or put impressions upon us, right? So when he comes in these various forms, there's usually a reason. The idea of the fire and the cloud, and then later he, so he starts it there in Genesis 15. Later he'll use it in Exodus when he's leading the people again, and they'll understand that. They'll go, oh, this is the Lord we're following. So they're, they're going to have the, So God is just revealing himself and showing man how he can recognize it's the Lord. And certainly one of the ways that we discern it as we're reading the written word of God is how do people respond? And what, we, what did we just see with Abram in verses 1 through 8? Hurried, rushed, ran, served, stood, watched. He was ready. He was the ready Johnny on the spot, right? He understood these were not just men. These were something else, right? And he literally says, I am your servant. So that was why I put it in the title, and Abram served them in haste or, you know, with attentiveness or something along those lines. Um, All right, now he says in uh, 19 to 15, he gives them this message in person, and he says, Sarah's going to do what? She's going to have your child. It's your wife, Sarah, that is going to have this, uh, your child. And then what did Sarah do? She laughed. Now, how does that relate to Abraham? Didn't he laugh? Mm -hmm. Hmm. But what do we see as the difference here? Sarah laughs, and what does the the Lord do? How does he handle that? (laughs) Sarah laughed. At the news, now she, but she says she laughed to herself, and she was in the tent. Mm-hmm. So she thought she was in private. She was having a private moment. So what does this tell us about this one who's there visiting? He knows her heart and her mind. He knows what's going on in secret, right? So this is, again, a, an understanding of the Lord. That This is where, again, the narrative dictates to us uh, an understanding that this angel that has, or the, the Lord who, it says literally the Lord appeared, so that's number one. And then it says, behold, three men, so that means he wasn't alone. Two angels came with the Lord when he came, and Abram is serving them, and now she is in the tent. He gives this news, your, your wife, Sarah, your wife, the old lady in the tent, she's going to have a baby, and she laughs about it. Now, the distinction between that and what Abraham did, when Abraham laughed, let me pull that back up here. In verse 16, I will bless her and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. And then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? So he laughs also, right? But what does Romans 4 tell us about, about Abraham? Because it looks like he's doubting, doesn't it, in that verse? But he tells us in Romans 4, he did not waver in his unbelief. So what was his laughter about? Happiness. And ha! Huh, isn't that just like God to do the, uh, the impossible? Isn't that funny? People are going to be talking about this for a long time. I mean, his laughter was delight that God would do the impossible. 
right? It was, a la it was a laughter of faith, not doubt, delighting in the power of God to do that impossible thing, right? But when Sarah laughs, she laughed to herself saying, so it's to herself in verse 12, after I have become old, shall I have pleasure, the pleasure of becoming a mom, my Lord being so old? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Well, then what does Sarah do when she's confronted? She denies it. She, she rubs salt in her own wound. She denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh. <laughs> Why did she do that? She was afraid. She recognized, so it's an interesting dynamic going on here. It's like she recognized that he was the Lord, but she's still, but she's doubting, is it possible for my, a woman my age? So she's having a down moment. Ups and downs, just like Abraham had had. She's having a down moment where her faith is not very strong right here. She is doubting, apparently, because he literally rebukes her. He said, oh, but you did laugh, right? But in a way, he's also doing what for her? Well, reassuring that she could recognize that being a laugh in the voice. Yeah. 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 I, re I knew your thoughts. I knew your heart. I know even the motives of your heart, and the motives of your heart at this moment, they're not faith. It's doubt. And I'm telling you, is anything too difficult for God? Tell me that, Sarah. Is anything too difficult for God? I mean, he's really calling her on the carpet on this one. He did not do that with Abraham. Does that tell you the difference between the laughters here? He knows their heart. Abraham did not waver in faith. Hebrews tell, or Romans tells us that, right? But here, it, Sarah is called on it. So God is saying, don't doubt me. I'll be back this time next year, and you will have a son. And one of the, you know, one of the laughters here that, that Abraham can have that laugh is God, you know, he's mm -hmm. waiting, mm -hmm. but he didn't doubt. Right. So it's a, an inner He's like, oh, man. I know, and so his laughter really was delight that, the, that God would do something in such a supernatural way that he would get so much glory in it too, right? Um, it, it reminded me of the um, Melchizedek encounter where he didn't take the, 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 uh, re, the um, what do you call it, the booty of the war because he wanted God to be the one that got the glory. He understood he didn't win that war, God did. And so he was giving God that credit for doing that. Here in, here in this record, Abraham laughed because he was giving God glory again. It was like, ha, ah, that is just like my God to do such a thing. I mean, that would have been his heart's thoughts. But Sarah here is apparently having a little doubt because she's looking at her poor old wrinkled hands, right, and her poor little bony knees at this point, and her dried up withered womb, and she's saying, really, God, you're going you're gonna to do what? Right? She just can't fathom it. But on, on a human level, is it, does it seem like a reasonable mm -hmm. doubt? Yeah, it does seem like a reasonable doubt. But what is the message then in this for you and I today in our faith walk with God? When we look at the impossible, I mean, I even think of just a bigger, the bigger, grander plan. The rapture is coming. And I'm looking at this world and going, what a mess, Right? But isn't it comforting to know the promises of God that he says, I'm coming to take you, to catch you up. Um, you will be with me forever. You will be my bride. I'm going to take you to a place, and I'm gonna, we're going to have a wedding and a feast. And you know, I'm looking forward to that, and I'm believing God for that. But are there people, even in the church, who say they love God and believe God, but they don't believe in the rapture, mm -hmm. which is beyond all belief to me. I'm like, have you ever read the word of God? I mean, how can you not understand that's a fundamental part of your salvation is belief that you will be taken to be with the Lord and that he's going to rescue us out just as he's rescued Noah out. What we're going to be looking at next then is the encounter concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. And what does he say? Go ahead. No, that's okay. Go ahead.
Yes, but God. Right. Right. And that's the difference between what Abraham did when he laughed and when Sarah laughed. And the way you know which one is honored and which one is not, which one is heart is right and which heart is not right, is the response. God did not respond to Abraham's laugh. And later in history, we have commentary in the New Testament that tells us he never wavered in his faith regarding the seed, the promised seed. But Sarah apparently was wavering a bit here. But he gets her back online pretty quickly, I'll bet, right? Okay, we're almost done here. Sarah laughed at the news, um, and the Lord rebuked. So, I, in a way, though, I do think it's really interesting. This tells us that the having doubt is not a problem. There are going to be times when we have doubts. And we can doubt God and still be in relationship with God. And he can still love us and still bless us. And all those things are still solidly secure because we're in covenant with him. So, Abraham is, is a testimony of that. So, Abraham's laughter. So, let's put this up here. And his was in 1717, and then hers is now in 1814. So I just want to make a point that there's a contrast here between the two laughters. Okay. Um, he knew, the Lord knew her private thoughts in 13 and 15, and he knew her child would be a boy, and he, she, and he tells her this, again, it's the foreknowledge of God. Okay, now 16 to 21. Now the Lord brings up another subject. Interesting that he kind of merges two things together here in one place. But he does do a really good job for us of tying it into why it, it's fitting for this to occur right here in, in this narrative. What, it, what happens in uh, 16 to 21? What does the Lord do? What does he tell him? The Lord tells him he's going to take out Sodom and put him out for him. Yeah. But he tells Abram of Sodom's judgment that's coming. Um, and, and why does he tell them? Hmm? Well, Lot is there, but he... Since Abraham has surely become a great and mighty nation, there you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Yeah, because of the fact that Abram is going to be the father of a great nation. And, and literally, he goes on, he says, I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abram what he has spoken about him. Now, what's going on in Sodom? Are they living in righteousness? No. Sodom, and he goes on, the contrast then follows it in verse 20. The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. So what is God doing by uh, disclosing this or telling this, this event that's going to... I mean, Abram may or may not know about it until maybe later, and he may not even make an association. But God is making sure that he's saying, I'm telling you this right now because I have chosen you to lead a nation in righteousness. I'm telling you, I'm going to go and judge a city or two that are not living in righteousness. And by the way, does this not also fall back all the way to uh, Genesis 6 with the, with the flood? Remember what had happened on the earth in those days, how far into sin we had gotten, and that God came and destroyed everything? Here now, he's just, just he's not destroying by a flood. He's destroying by fire and brimstone when we get there. But he's telling Abraham, because Abraham is supposed to lead a great nation,
He's supposed to lead them to right, righteousness or into right, righteousness. He was chosen to raise up a righteous nation, however you want to say that, okay? So in this, what we see then is the Lord has... Um, the Lord has come because of Sodom's wickedness. And that's in verse 20. Uh, God judged the sinner and saved the righteous back in Genesis. So we can make that parallel can't we with Genesis 6 uh, God saved Noah right who was righteous and therefore what we see here is God is going to again judge God now will again judge the wicked but there's a contrast that's made in here. What is, a, what is the concern of Abraham? Yeah. Are you, surely you're a God of justice, right? You're not going to destroy the righteous along with the wicked, are you? Right? Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So here's another point that we learn about the Lord. This is a new... Um, nuance to who God is. He's a, he is the judge. Now, we've already seen him judge previously through wiping out everything, but this time it's, it's like now he's using a pin light and he's, or a laser, you know, to cut away the cancers in, on the earth. And so it seems to me like what we're seeing here then is God is saying, no, I won't wipe out the whole earth, but Sodom and Gomorrah, they've gone too far, and I'm going to take care of them. Now, Yeah. Who who do you think who do you think when they cry to the Lord that would it have been right? Could be. Yeah, of course. Good question. God had to beat him over the head and drag him out. And I also think that what it could be is the victims of those who are who are abusing them. I mean, kind of like when Israel was in their captivity and God's heard the outcry of them, right? Well, like the same thing happened in Revelation. Mm -hmm. How long, O oh Lord, until you avenge our blood? So the victims of of the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah are crying out, and God is hearing it. Now, whether they're crying out to God or not in Sodom, those people who are victims, I don't know. It doesn't go there. It just says he hears. So in a chapter, though, that follows the previous one where he says God hears and God sees, what are we seeing here? God hears and God sees, right? Um, I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. Um, I really think what this, again, is doing is showing us the intimacy of God. He, he, the, the word Lord that's used in this chapter, verse at the opening, of, shows his personal intimate relationship with his covenant people. Um, in, the, in regarding Sodom and Gomorrah, these are not his covenant people, obviously. He's going to destroy them. Um, but what he's doing is not for the sake of Sodom and Gomorrah here. What he's really showing us, whose sake is it for? Abraham. He's demonstrating to Abraham something. Does that make sense? Yeah. He's I, almost I, telling him, don't worry, I'm going to go down and check. You know, you know. He already knows. <laughs> he already knows. But he had to physically come in order to demonstrate to Abraham something that was of value for Abraham to understand. Abraham, if you're going to raise up a righteous nation, you need to know firsthand, I'm a God who judges. And I don't tolerate wickedness. And it will be judged eventually, and sometimes I intervene in history and judge. Do we not even see that in our world today? Often, I mean, a lot of people don't like to talk about it, but sometimes certain places on the earth get wiped out. Now, sometimes 
good people get hurt as well. But the point is, is that God is the one who is controlling that. And sometimes he goes in and wipes out certain areas, I think, for reason. Um, we, we, many years ago, there was a tidal wave that took out the whole beach area. Where was it? In Th Thailand? I think that's right. Something like that. One of my missionary friends, uh, she's passed away now, but uh, Betsy went to uh, Thailand and was there for a few weeks. And I got to see her shortly after she came back from that. And she was talking about how the people, the locals, the day that that, ti that tidal wave came in and wiped them all out, they were at the beach offering sacrifices to these false gods. And she said they were all talking about how they felt like it was a judgment from God. And I thought, yeah, probably, you know. Yes. Yeah, well, absolutely it was. Yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and it's right down at the, you know, at the very bottom of where the Dead Sea is, as you just come up along the back side of that, basically in Jordan. So it's just along it. Now, now they're guessing on the Gomorrah one, but Sodom they found, and they apparently found uh, remains or what do you call it, you know, through archaeological, archaeological digs, yeah. Um, so they've confirmed where they believe Sodom is now. Yeah. Okay. I have, now. I have one other question. Mm -hmm. In verse 17, he goes in and the Lord said, Shall I now live by faith? I guess I was wondering, what is the Lord, what is the, the Lord saying here through these verses? I mean, I know it's, it's written for, for us to contemplate, but, you know, he, he says, Shall I die from old age? Well, he's, he's, the verse preceding it says, They stood up and they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. And, he, and he, then he turns to him and says, Shall I hide from you what I'm about to do? If, in fact, I am raising you up to be the leader of a nation and to birth a nation, that's to be a holy nation, a peculiar people, a nation unto me, um, I th basically what in his, in a bib in his way of saying things he's literally saying I want you to understand I'm about to do something and there's a lesson in this for you. I I really believe that's the questions I guess that Abraham asked. Maybe so Abraham would would know that there are not very many God's good people. At yeah. All. Yeah. Okay. But I and I at this point he showed up I think primarily to announce the birth of Isaac because it, it, it required that deliberate, personal touch of don't miss it, don't be confused, don't second guess, this is the heir, right? So he, he came specifically for that first and foremost. And, and also then he follows it with another event that's going to have a profound impact on that son that's about to be born, and that is... Through him is going to come this nation, and you are going to be a leader that's going to that's going to teach righteousness. And why is that important? Because I judge wickedness. And I think it was I think that the the narrative uh, lends itself to to just impress upon us what God is doing is using the circumstance of the day and the moment to teach Abraham something that he needed to have clarified. Don't misunderstand. I'm not just doing this to bless you. I'm doing this because you have a mission. Your mission is going to be to raise up a nation of godly people that will walk in righteousness, walk before me, be my people, and I will be their God. And the only way you're going to understand that is when you understand the profound um, result of wickedness, that wickedness brings death. And, it, and so he, had, he was giving him a very pragmatic demonstration of what will happen if you don't understand that. And I, I mean, I think there's nothing better than the horror. I mean, we're watching the news this morning and seeing tornadoes that have wiped out whole communities. And you stand there gasping at the TV and just almost weeping because you just know, well, if that was my house and it was just gone, and there you, and you just can empathize with the people. You just feel it in your being. This is what I think he wanted to bring out in Abraham was a, a kind of to jolt him into understanding the profound significance of the role 
that the responsibility that he was giving to Abraham in this moment. I am giving you this heir, but I'm not just giving him to bless you. I'm giving him because you're going to raise up a righteous nation. That's exactly what he says. I have chosen you so that you may command your children and your household after you to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Because through that nation, being obedient to the law, which he's going to give eventually through Moses, that nation then, that pictorial imagery of the law is going to portray Christ. And he tells us in the New Testament that was what the law did. It was a tutor to lead them to Christ. And he's saying, you have to teach your, your descendants to obey me and to understand wickedness will be judged, righteousness will be rewarded, obey and be blessed, disobey and be cursed. That's coming for them in that nation. wild donkey, donkey. yeah from that Hagar from going outside mm -hmm. and from there on that bloodline mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know about what you would lost his father his I don't know the it doesn't really tell us from Sodom or Gomorrah maybe you know we know she turned it we'll we'll know soon we're going to get there because I haven't really it's been a long time since I've looked at that but what I'm saying is this is strategically placed in the passage to uh, impress upon Abraham that he has a responsibility to raise up a righteous nation and to understand the consequences of wickedness. Okay? All right. So there's that. And then he, the great thing is, is Abraham's response then to that, um, which is 22 and 23, or 22 to 33, I should say. Uh, what does Abraham do? He yeah, he intercedes for the righteous of Sodom. Isn't that awesome? So it's like, oh, but Lord, will you will you judge the the wicked along or the righteous along with the wicked? Can you spare that city if there be fifty? You know, and then he goes through the the dialogue until he gets down to just ten. Even if there's just ten. Will you still? And he says, no, for the sake of 10, I won't. Were there 10? No. We're going to find that out soon. <laughs> so Abraham intercedes. He stands in the gap, as they say, right? As a prayer warrior for the righteous. Of Sodom. And he might very well have been thinking of Lot. Was it you that brought up Lot? One of you all brought up Lot. That Well, maybe he was even thinking about, well, my, you, my, my nephew, Lot's living down there. I mean, you know, he might have been thinking that. But the, the, what we learned then about the Lord, and we didn't get to talk about it, but I went through and I'm, I, each of the chapters here, I gave you the, the names, the titles of God and their definitions so that you would have them specifically. And you can take this as a pattern and make your own charts from this point forward if you like or if you want to go back and do it. But just the titles alone give you so much insight about what, who God is, how he's portraying himself and what the emphasis is in each chapter, how he's dealing with these people. So here we see this another uh, appearance of Christ in the, in the form of, a, of an angel, but it, he literally calls him the Lord, so it's very clear it's speaking about that he's the Lord. But he is the judge of all the earth, he deals justly in judgment, and he will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Whew. Am I ever glad to hear that, right? And this one, the title, one thing, and we're done. We did it. <laughs> it only took us an extra, an extra hour. Um, so again, he, the Lord appears to tell them what? Yeah, Sarah will have a son. I mean, so now he's named her by name for sure. And then what happens after that? 
judgment of Sodom. Now, it would be cool to get a better title on that judgment of Sodom part to kind of weave it into the idea of why, because it, it, he literally just says, because I've chosen you to do this, I have chosen you for this, and this is why I'm not going to hide this information from you. I'm just not quite sure how to do it, because it was too com complicated. But I love that. Yeah. Well, yeah, he does judge, but how does that tie in with Abraham, the fact that she's going to have a son, and therefore I'm going to judge Sodom to show you that your heirs need to, I mean, see how long it gets, I mean, it, it's like you almost have to explain it. So I, if you just say Sodom is judged, you, you can for yourself go, oh yeah, that's where God said, because you're going to be a leader of a nation, you need to teach them righteousness. So I'm going to show you what happens to unrighteous cities. And uh, he, so he demonstrates it to him. And I think there's no better learning method than being demonstrated, you know, experiencing the wrath of God and to see it. It, sh it would have been headline news, you know. CNN would have been all over that one. <laughs> All right, bye, you guys. Thank you for being patient. It was a long study. Thank you.